So wh what I will go through uh, quickly and still leave some time for discussion is talking a little bit about healthcare data, the transition from paper to electronic, and what that means in terms of uh, data and information quality capture. There's a little bit about the multidimensional uh, nature of data and information quality, and then considerations in these emerging uh, federated research networks, which you're all familiar with probably from the platform perspective, but are really quite new when it comes to uh, the clinical data. Can I just quickly ask, how many of you have clinical backgrounds? Anybody? Okay, and anybody work with clinical data specifically? A, f a few more. Okay, so so it'll be okay to spend a little bit of time telling you what's going on. In the, and how many of you are uh, from the U.S.? And how many from the EU? Okay, so the you know the issues are somewhat different because, in which you guys all probably know, but the U.S. is not uh, doesn't. Politically, we don't have a, a great appetite for regulations, including regulations around standards, and we do not have a national health care system. So those two things combined have made it very difficult to introduce standards and regulations onto the data quality and data information side of the world. And it's not meant to be a political announcement 10 days before the election or wherever we are. But that's all the cab driver could talk about when I was getting over here. I just wanted to get here. Uh, I, I want to acknowledge these Michigan colleagues, uh, Peter Metham when he was there, Amitav Shi, Jamie Estill, and Lisa Ferguson particularly. Uh, their uh, job titles do not begin to do justice to the depth of knowledge, the deep computational and mathematical uh, insights these folks have into this. And um, I think we're, we're excited about where we think we're going to be able to go. So healthcare data, from going from paper to digital, are we there yet? Uh, I'm obviously sensitive to uh, Florence Nightingale as a background. She was in nursing. We love her because she founded the discipline of nursing. But more importantly, she founded biostatistics and outcomes assessment and analysis. And the statistical world is starting to uh, revisit her contributions. I just did a little snippet from um, Science News within the last year or so, the passionate statistician. In 1845, uh, she was writing notes on hospitals and testifying in England before the Queen, uh, trying to get um, regulations in place or some standards for documenting within hospitals. Scarcely an instance have I been able to obtain hospital records fit for any purpose of comparison. If they could com be obtained, they could show how money was being spent, what good was uh, really being done with it, or whether the money was doing mischief rather than good. So if you can hold that thought, we'll come back to it in a flash forward. Um, in the U.S., the uh, starting in 2004, George uh, W. Bush really does get credit for um, launching the electronic health record agenda in the U.S. Uh, by He appointed the first uh, Holder, Dr. David Brailler, as to the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technologies. This was a huge advance. Unfortunately, he had no budget, and it was a position of influence. By uh, 2009, uh, Barack Obama was in place, and the Affordable Care Act had been passed, and the whole high-tech regulation, which really uh, created lots and lots of incentives to adopt electronic health records. Uh, the goal was to computerize the nation's health records in five years, saving billions of dollars in costs and countless lives. And the High Tech Act, as I said, was signed into law in 2009. And uh, ONC, the Office of the National Coordinator, got some staff finally to about over 150 employees, and there was really finally a dedicated federal workforce to uh, proceed on this front. One of the key pillars. There are multiple programs within the High Tech Act, but one was the uh, meaningful use, which is in yellow, this diagram across the middle. And Medicare and Medicaid, who are, you know, major payers and drivers of payment policies in the U.S., uh, initiated a program of incentives and penalties for the use and uptake of EHRs, and particularly the meaningful use of those EHRs. So there, was a, there are still a whole set of uh, reporting requirements that have things that have to be transmitted electronically in some standard formats 
that demonstrate improved individual population health outcomes, increased, excuse me, increased transparency, and improved ability to study and improve care delivery. And in the U.S., this is what drove the adoption of EHRs. We wouldn't have this clinical data to pull together with our genome, genome data uh, without this, this act. And some, this was the most recent data I could find on this, uh, but as of 2014, you can see the rapid uptake in moving from electronic or paper records to electronic health records, uh, completely tied to the meaningful use incentives. And they're now penalties. We've moved beyond incentives to um, penalties. And uh, along with that uptake, there's been uh, increased functionality in the EHR. So it's not just a basic uh, shell to meet the minimum requirements of meaningful use, but people are really looking at uh, more advanced decision support and more advanced retrievals, I think, which is what we're uh, interested in. The federal government also has an HIT strategic plan. And I think importantly, almost every federal agency is held to the agenda of the federal HIT plan. Here's a list of them. You can see NIH and HRSA and CDC and FDA and the uh, whole alphabet soup of federal agencies that have a uh, part to play in federal health IT, HIT. Just want to point out the mission because it relates to the data quality piece. It's to improve the health and well-being of individuals and communities through the use of technology and health information that's accessible when and where it matters most. So the, the emphasis is really on quality of care and clinical outcomes and population health management. It's not on the data and information quality itself. That's sort of a byproduct. And if you dig through this document, um, you'll see that the data, I, I actually did a word search on it. And I think the word quality comes up mm, a handful of times, especially around data. So it really has not been an emphasis in the federal HIT plan. So back, back to where Florence Nightingale was in 1865, if we do this, and if we collaborate, we'll have value, respect individual preferences, uh, uh, create an environment of continuous learning, encourage innovation, be a worthy steward of the country's money and trust. And that third bullet, build, build a culture of, of electronic health information access and use. And that's probably been uh, one of the more difficult ones to overcome. Uh, this slide, this web link was still accurate this morning. This is on the, uh, Health and Human Services, hhs.gov. It's their uh, uh, customer or the uh, citizen-facing page about medical records, and that's the image. It's somebody in the old medical record room with the paper records index and stored. And that, I mean, despite $48 billion being spent on high tech, we're it, it, this is a very different paradigm shift that we're going through at, in the country. And this is the uh, strategic plan. And you can see that we're moving from the three-year 17-18 uh, uh, agenda space, where uh, moving beyond sending and receiving a, common of a core set of common data elements to uh, interoperable HIT and really demonstrating improved health and a lower cost. And this agenda in the middle is probably uh, the focus of a lot of the political debate going on right now. Have we actually uh, improved health and, and lowered cost? Uh, here's an example of the reimbursement drivers that have been attached to it, and again, where we're at we're with all of this. Uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, has uh, initiated a new program, MACRA, which combined uh, three programs that were, uh, that um, CMS funded the Physician Quality Reporting System, so it's quality metrics coming out of EHRs, uh, the Physician Value-Based Payment Modifier, and then the Medicare EHR incentive program. So all of these are real, uh, were drivers. And clinical clinics and hospitals got a, a lot of money. Uh, when I was at Mayo, I, I, Mayo was a fully uh, electronic for years, fully integrated EHR. And I think the Mayo benefit from the initial meaningful use criteria was around $75, $80 million, something like that. It was not an insignificant amount of money. Um, Michigan is a later adopter of integrated EHRs, and uh, the incentive payment was lower proportionately. So to me, there was some, I, I think the money uh, indicated 
maturity in terms of integrated clinical systems uh, didn't necessarily put that money where it was most needed to uh, you know, fl- raise the tide and float everybody's boat. But just, uh, just this week, CMS has announced they're going to pull back on this a little bit, specifically on the areas of interoperability, information blocking when exchanging data and information across vendors, the use of certified information technology is a very hot topic, and then the use of EHRs to improve care. Uh, it's not progressing quite as fast as people had hoped. So let's talk about, uh, I guess, in, what I wanted to, uh, the point I wanted to make out of these slides is uh, data, the whole effort around electronic digital data in the practice clinical care delivery world is being driven by the value, outcomes over the cost of care delivery, and the country's effort to get a handle on value. It's not being driven by data and information quality per se, and in fact, that's kind of a um, uh, uh, it's, it's not as prevalent a theme as I think we're going to need to achieve that value-based perspective in clinical data. And it's, it affects all of us who are wanting to use these data for uh, healthcare research and health research. So just a little bit about the multidimensional na- nature of digital data and information quality, and a lot of this uh, you folks probably know better than I do. In fact, when uh, Peter was meeting with us last week in uh, Ann Arbor, uh, Jamie Estel said a very, very kind, th- I don't know if he was talking to me specifically, but he, we were talking about open tools and tools that, uh, like Peter's product, enable users to not have to be very deep technical people in order to use the tools to achieve their needs. And, and Jamie nicely used the word um, technically challenged. I might be one of the technically challenged people. This is why I'm saying you, you guys are probably further, much further ahead on on this, but as when we started really looking into what was going on with our data quality, and I'll show you some of our reports in a few minutes, um, when it came to our involvement in the PCORI Federated Data Research Network, you know, this seems to be a very uh, key, key paper uh, coming out of the MIT Data Quality Group, where they're really trying to look at data quality as a multifaceted dimension. There's this intrinsic data quality, uh, contextual, representational and accessibility around the data quality piece. It's a very nice um, kind of seminal anchoring article talking about why we've had to move from a focus on just the database syntactic issues to more the use type perspective on data quality. Last year, or 2009 this was, they published a, a really another nice paper, another big review paper, and they looked at what types of methods and what types of topics are being addressed in the data quality world. And again, an even uh, more of a focus on use perspective of the data. So data quality impact, technical solutions for data quality, data quality in the context of computer science and IT, and then data quality and curation. And these topics are emerging as are, I think, some of the nice, more advanced methods on the right as data are becoming available, obviously, and we're starting to figure out how to handle them. Uh, my understanding is this is now the organizing structure for data quality papers in the ACM journals. So I think it's kind of holding up in terms of both the topics that are under the umbrella of data quality and then the methods that are currently uh, in place. ISO just last year in 2015 published a new standard on information data quality. Is anybody here familiar with that? Those, that set of documents? I don't think they're widely uh, known at all. I thought I had brought them and I didn't. There's a packet of about eight of them out, about this thick, and like most, I mean each collectively, so they're small documents in and of themselves. Uh, you know, I'm living in the academic world now, not the practice world, and one pays for these things out of your research funds. And this was close to $900 or so for me to get that set of standards. And I think it's kind of the uh, problem when we're trying to push standards out and we don't make them freely available, right? It's very difficult. But I think they're on the right track in terms of talking about 
uh, similarly, in defining data quality as a set of characteristics that allow the users to determine if data and information are fit for use. So we've moved, I think with this, we've really moved from this notion of data quality as accuracy to data quality as a multidimensional set of features that let the user and consumer of the data decide if it's going to be appropriate for my use. And that's a, a huge um, Factor specific, specifically when we're using EHR data and the data aren't being prospectively collected for a specific experiment or for a multi-site research study. Uh, the clinical data we're wanting to use and pull together for these, um, for integrating uh, data from multiple sources, not just uh, you know your world of omics data, but also the clinical data and personal health data that's retained on our smartphones or Fitbits or what have you, or trying, or portals trying to pull all that together, um, we're going to have different ideas on what the quality of the data and the information are. The uh, ISO standards are, brief, are broken down into the syntax, semantics, and pragmatics in terms of dimensions of quality. That's not unique to data and information quality. And I will be uh, showing you some examples of how uh, challenging it's been to, for us to meet, have our clinical data meet uh, syntax, semantics, and pragmatic quality standards, and where PCORI is at in one, uh, as one federated data research network. I think the upside is that, and this is a general statement uh, from Gartner just last year. It's got to be true if Gartner published it, right? But I loved the statistic, the primary reason for 40% of all business initiatives failing to achieve their targeted benefits, they're attributing to poor data quality. They're saying it affects labor productivity by as much as 20%. And you all know how much you do with terms of data cleaning, even when you know what the experiment is supposed to be about, what the variables are and the source of the data are. That is a gross underestimate in terms of labor productivity when it comes to using uh, clinical data collected in the course of care delivery. There's probably an 80-20 thing in place for that side of the world. And uh, I think this last bullet, uh, as uh, business processes become automated, data quality becomes a rate limiting factor. And that's, uh, you'll see with the federated research networks, and especially PCORI, where the queries are being sent out from a centralized coordinating center run behind the firewalls of each center. Uh, this is showing up to be, to be a concern. And the business value of data quality in health and healthcare is obviously you've got to have confidence in the findings. And in contrast to a lot of businesses that are looking at data quality as a problem, you know, I've got to clean up the data, get a better handle on the data, know more about the customers. In healthcare, there's obviously this notion of risk or hazard. Real, if our data quality, electronic di data quality are not solid in the clinical space, we're firing decision support rules or we are, uh, they really affect people's lives. The FDA is getting involved in managing these sorts of things now because of that. Our conclusions of our studies are questionable all in all. So again, data quality is fit for purpose is really essential. And in healthcare, because we have just so recently adopted EHRs in this country, uh, it's, it's really a, a very um, nascent topic in terms of uh, development and understanding of where we're going with this. And this is from GSN, GS1, but I think this is a this has actually been a very effective slide for me to use at Michigan with the um, IT lead, leaders I work with on the clinical side of the world. You know, the cumulative cost of these short-term solutions, where you're just trying to fix the problem du jour, are ineffective and they're costly, and you you're doomed to repeat your mistakes over and over again, and you're doomed to do small fixes over and over again. Uh, we really uh, need to invest in long-term solutions over time, and it ends up being cheaper. And when, as we're going into this federated research world where there are different data models and different data configurations for each federation, uh, this becomes even more important. Uh, we're, we're not on a sustainable path right now. Uh, and just to sum this up, to challenges in healthcare, you know, as I mentioned earlier, ongoing changes to care delivery and reimbursement models, and that will continue to drive what clinical agencies put priorities on in terms of data and information quality. 
the uh, I think there's probably not a really deep understanding of how this labor and skills intensive services and the workflows that clinicians do impacts uh, quality and safety of patient care or when HIT gets involved, the impact of that on H, uh, quality and safety, let alone the quality and safety of the data. And just as an example, the every organization has challenges with uh, clinicians who are putting notes in in free text with a copy and paste from the previous note. And every uh, organization has problems with uh, the layout of things like flow sheets, they're like Excel spreadsheets that uh, many people document in to get a time sequence. Uh, sometimes many of those uh, flow sheets, the newest column shows up on the left side of the page, not the right side of the page. So we get the oldest data sometimes captured over on the left side rather than the right side. And the IT folks are thinking about updated columns in a dynamic fashion differently than the clinicians who read left to right, or people have these options to carry forward uh, values within some of the drop-down boxes from one use to another. And it's just, we could go on and on about that, let alone starting to integrate uh, drug libraries that some are proprietary and some are open, but they don't talk to each other. So in the whole medication life cycle, for example, the uh, supply chain management that pharmacy uses has very a very different, it doesn't have standardized uh, barcoding in place right now. So pharmacies have had to invest tens of millions of dollars into these uh, barcoding machines so they can take their bulk delivered meds and break them down into what are called unit doses or single doses, barcode those in a way that's conformant to the technology that's being used to deposit those uh, drugs in a automated drug dispensing machine, and then the barcode uh, technology that's used at the bedside before that medication is administered. And those drug libraries don't necessarily talk to each other. The workarounds are phenomenal, and we're not seeing any reduction in medication errors in the uh, inpatient side of the world anyway. So the, the thing I want to make is the standards, standards, standards. It, and again, it is I can't emphasize enough uh, what a challenge it is to not have standards in place in the U.S. that we still don't have a business driver for them. And I think that was one of the great opportunities with high tech, and it's still coming. But the um, there was no mandate for the epics of the world to use standardized formats for translating data. And it's not just epic. It's Cerner and it's uh, Meditech and any of them. Uh, many of those companies have closed data models. Uh, so, for example, at Michigan, we're an Epic shop. We used to have a homegrown system. It's now Epic because Epic could accomplish the billing stuff faster than any system, and they pr brought great value to the market in that place. But we own the data, but we can't publish the data models, so we lose all the information context around the data in the tables that are being delivered. It's an enormous problem when we uh, talk about participating in um, federated research networks and, and other uses as well. The last thing was a pretty interesting statistic as well. Uh, healthcare IT, compared to other industries, less than half the expen uh, expenditure, 35 to 4.5% versus 10% or higher in many other industries. So those are significant challenges. All right, so moving to federated research networks, and I, this is a very local perspective uh, from, uh, from where I sit. I think the goals are terrific across all of them, uh, designed to optimize clinical data for research. Uh, each network in the U.S. or each clinical organization in the U.S. that's participating networks has to conform their local data to a different common data model. So for example, we're part of the PCORI Federated Research Network. Our uh, CTSA group is also joining uh, the March. It's a Midwest research collaboration. They have a different data model. Uh, we have people in our cancer group who are really wanting to join uh, the cancer link, another proprietary type data model. We have um, uh, people who in the cancer world at Michigan who are very involved in, in um, uh, CA grid, CA big type efforts, uh, yet another data model. Uh, you know, HL7 is certainly there with the bridge model in terms of 
uh, collaboration with CDISC for the research standards. That's a place that really is getting some uptake, but I think it's because pharma is, is behind that. So there's a different business driver than there is for uptake of the other common data models. But this stuff is, are, it's like the unfunded mandates. You know, the organization wants to and needs to participate in these collaborations, but there, is, there are not resources. And there's, uh, there's a, from the local level, a, 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 some, uh, quite, quite a few concerns emerging around all this. Some of which are the data access incentives have to be balanced. Uh, privacy and security are big deals. Do we sell data? Do we not sell data? Well, you know, I think we're, we're moving further along with that. I understand there's going to be a new uh, common rule update will be published by the end of this year, is what I saw about a week or so ago. That will uh, be maybe helpful in this regard. Uh, data ownership and transfer of data, uh, data sharing agreements, uh, liability. There's a huge risk aversion, obviously, in clinical agencies to to the data breaches issues. Um, I'm not going to go through these one by one. But I think one of the big things that's happening for organizations is that this shift of thinking about data governance, well, first of all, thinking about data governance, but then thinking about data as an asset, just like the dollars have to be stewarded, the data have to be stewarded. And, and across the country, organizations are at very different levels of um, commitment to that effort. And again, standards are uh, adopted very, very uh, differently, different approaches. So the PCORI example, this is the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. It was funded by Congress as part of the Affordable Care Act. $650 million, oh, per year. Um, that's an understatement of, of the amount. It's, it's a little bit more than that. The funding is different, though, as a mechanism. There, the legislation requires uh, stakeholder engagement broadly, so payers patients, uh, families, uh, the researchers, obviously, and the clinical health system leaders as well. So no study gets vetted through the PCORI Collaborative Data Research Network without the whole network, without being prioritized by a table of these stakeholders. Uh, the goal is reproducible and transparent research plans, so protocols will be posted. Uh, the consent forms are targeted to be posted starting next January, should the common rule issues change. Uh, criteria are outlined by statute. Um, so lot, lots of opportunities and good goals in the funding mechanism. Right now, there are 13 uh, Oh, the PCORNET is a subset of PCORI research. Then. So PCORI funds investigator-initiated studies, but they also fund two types of data networks. One is the clinical data research networks. There are 13 of those around the country. They vary in numbers of organizations that belong to each one of these networks, uh, from a couple million to, uh, I think, Kaiser's uh, network all by itself. So many millions. And then there are also patient-provided research networks, which are condition-specific, run by patient groups. So it's, there's one on Alzheimer's, and there's one on uh, chronic kidney disease, and there are a variety of patient-provided research networks. Interestingly, not much going on in the world of cancer. There have been some politics at the level to separate you know, the uh, funding from NCI from the funding of PCORI that's uh, put up some artificial barriers. But the idea is to build out this whole national infrastructure for patient-centered research. Uh, currently, there are uh, 35 of these networks, so the slide is a little bit outdated, but it covers the whole country. And across these, uh, with everybody implementing the same common data model, the goal is that the queries will come from a central location, a coordinating center, and can be run across up to 100 million patient records because every uh, there are patient IDs and clinical data all stored behind the firewalls of the individual networks and organizations. So it's a clever model. Uh, they have not standardized to the platforms and the data models underneath this. So some groups are using OMOP and some are using I2B2 and some are uh, using their own local homegrown systems, you know, and uh, so the when it comes to data quality and Information standardization, I think we have no sense of information loss or error propagation as we're going through through this. 
Uh, the driving principles are very good. Uh, data access for open science and open and shared tools, services, and resources. So similar culturally to Transmart. And this whole set of federal agencies that, uh, or many of the federal agencies that sat on the federal HIT plan, also sit on the PCORI board, including Francis Collins, who's head of the NIH. And so I think there's, I mean, there's a lot of uh, good intent and political will to try and make this work. It's, it's very new and it's a kind of a grand experiment. Uh, for required infrastructure, all that's required is the um, POP MedNet application. This is developed, uh, it's a federally funded effort. Uh, Harvard Pilgrim runs it, the population medicine uh, group there, and they, uh, their contracted developer is Lincoln Peak Partners. Uh, it has a web-based, you know, browser-based UI where you uh, submit queries and receive queries and submit uh, aggregated data, it goes through a portal, accesses a data client locally, which sits on somebody's PC, uh, free software. Uh, we have not gotten into any community development efforts yet. We have been really scrambling just to get our MART up and running. And then a uh, secure API for communication. So the big advantage is that uh, the data partners keep their own data. So we run the analysis locally. We have just had our first query on uh, weight queries because obesity is one of the common conditions that each of these 13 networks has to address. And um, it has taken us and our partners uh, 20 hours to run that uh, SAS query that's being distributed this way. There's a lot of SQL stuff built into it and it uh, doesn't matter what platform they're running it off of. Uh, you know, so there's lots of quality work just on the coding side of the world to, to happen. Uh, but, the big, but this works only if your data are standardized to a common data model. I'll show you what that is. And again, we're just sharing aggregate data, no patient level, not even limited data sets at this point, although there's certainly a plan to share limited data sets. Uh, this is the overall uh, architecture. I don't know if you can see that very well. But on the right side, the, uh, the data marts sit, in, again, inside each uh, partner organization. Uh, there's a secure connection to the uh, data center that's hosted. Again, it's uh, by Lincoln Peak Partners, uh, specifically. And uh, the uh, system administrators and um, investigators and owners interact through, a, through an internet portal. We can talk more about that if you want. This is the PCORI uh, Common Data Model version 3. There's a 3.1 that's coming and a 4 uh, after the first of the year. The significance is that they're going to try and pull some uh, natural language processing tables into the Common Data Model coming up, which I think will be actually pretty interesting, except that I would bet uh, Half the organizations participating don't have NLP in place. The places that do are all using different tools. There's no common parameterizing of that. But I mean, those are the kinds of data quality issues that are going to uh, work themselves out. Uh, Corey and uh, Jeff Brown, I, I think, it probably says, look, we just have to figure out what we've got nationally in the absence of all these standards. And let's figure out what we've got. And let's just do this in an iterative approach. So the first round of studies, uh, nobody expects that these are uh, going to be anything but uh, learn a lot from them opportunities. But down the road, I think there's some real potential. What I want to call out, uh, a couple things. One is on the demographics table in the upper left, uh, there's a biobank flag there. So I would guess that would be of some interest to you folks. Uh, we are trying, to, actually, we've just gotten funded on a, a nice grant to do some metadata on informed consent documents that we can, right now, you. I'm sure many of you know better than I, but there's really no way to trace that informed consent, let alone HIPAA privacy and HIPAA waiver issues from the various bio uh, repositories all the way through this clinical data linkage. So this will be a, an interesting effort uh, to go down. The other thing that's a little bit uh, frustrating for us is a patient in the, up in the demographics table again. The notion of a patient isn't uh, modeled. It's patient ID, and it's a, a, obviously a, a linking uh, variable across these tables, but 
we're having trouble even defining what's a patient. So for example, uh, one of our uh, sources of, or one of our payers at Michigan is a Blue Cross Blue Shield HMO. And everybody participating in that HMO gets assigned a provider, a primary care provider at Michigan at the university. It doesn't matter if that patient ever shows up or not for the business driving purposes. They have a medical record number. Do we want those people in our PCORI data mart? And we have no way to model that in this common data model. Uh, organizations that run reference labs, for example, we have a lot of records with medical record numbers that are only generated by our reference labs. They have nothing to do with a patient who's ever shown up in the, in the system. So none of, none of that is, is specified in here. The metadata that accompanies this data model, uh, back to the paper paradigm, even in this environment, it's an Excel spreadsheet. It's this visual. You know, this is it. And there's an Excel spreadsheet that has a little more information, not a lot. Uh, it says, gosh, you might want to use HL7 null flavors, for example, for the not known, unknown, whatever, but no requirements. There's a 87-page PDF of the implementation guide. That Excel spreadsheet of the data model and the implementation guide are not connected in any way at all. So, you know, people are sitting all over um, the annotated data dictionary, uh, we submitted this first round uh, in May, our first data characterization test in an Excel spreadsheet. Us, every, every node, every, all of the 90 nodes submitted their own Excel spreadsheet for their annotated data dictionary. Uh, they're going to move to REDCap this year. This is an, uh, an advance that we're excited about. What we have done locally is build a semantic media wiki to try and manage this uh, and share it within our network. We have a data set catalog used within our network. We've built that off uh, CCAN and DCAT, the W3C DCAT models, and that is working very well for us, actually. And then uh, we're going to try and do uh, a little bit more with the data quality uh, metadata. So PCORI has just formed a data quality group in 2016. I'm going to, we're approaching data characterization cycle two. Uh, what I want, let me show you uh, this. Oh, this. This is a good slide to show you the data characterization tests that PCORI sends out. And again, they're adopting this fitness for use concept, but it's really focused on just a few. It's more like data profiling and some plausibility. That's the extent of it. But they just ran the first query across the 90 nodes in the country in April to June of this year, learned a lot. Uh, and are still in the process of rethinking what this next round is going to look like. It's going to include more tables, as you can see on the top. It's going to include uh, just one query package. One of the things they learned is that SQL queries were implemented differently if you had an Oracle database or if you had a, you know, a different type of database. Uh, so everybody had to build, set up a SAS data mart as well as their <coughs> regular data mart. And this, I think, has implications for Transmart, too, because they couldn't uh, really do the longitudinal analysis that they want in some of these queries off the relational databases. So I said we're moving to a red cap, uh, a few more data checks, again, largely syntax and pragmatics. Do these values make sense? And uh, s refreshes every six months. So you hold your SAS file frozen until the next data characterization test, but you can continue to update your relational database. Uh, these are just, I'm not, I'm not going to go through these because of time. These are all on the web, easily available, and I'll give you the web links to PCORI. So each of these networks, DV Chance, ours is 8.6, they're all between 8.5 and $8.6 million. These are the organizations in ours. Uh, we do everything locally and communicate directly with the Pop MedNet client that Pop, uh, Lincoln Peak Partners runs and communicate with the uh, operations center for the research networks in the middle on the left side and to the rest of the PCORI world through that. So I'm, let me show you, these will be pretty interesting, I think, for you to see. So it, I was speaking of paper paradigms. This is what our first uh, data characterization test looked like, just a uh, reports, but um, you know, how many patients did you see? This says 1.1 million, um, the age groups, uh, racial breakdowns. What a mess, the racial breakdowns, as they are everywhere. 
uh, gender. These were the allowable values. Some of these are uh, correspond to census OMB census data requirements. Some correspond to HL7 requirements. Some they'd like you to use LOINC for. Some they'd like you to use SNOMED for. None of that is in place yet. It's a um, and at various levels across the different nodes. This a little bit. Um, so this is uh, one of the things that drew their attention on our mart and made them, I don't know if you can see that, made them uh, do some follow-up phone calls with us and really uh, looks like marked variability over time. They're looking, uh, oh, these were vital measurements by metal, by date. Oh, that's not this one. So here, encounters. So encounters, there's a table. One of the PCORI tables is, let me show you that. Encounters up in the top left, which is a hugely important one. What's the interaction you had with the healthcare provider or system? But PCORI is not defining that, you know, so does it mean a clinic visit from start to finish? Does it mean a hospital stay from admission to discharge? Or does it mean what EPIC counts as an encounter as really very granular level interactions of an interaction, a billable interaction with a lab or an x-ray department or the clinician or whatever? So we took the granular approach as did other organizations. And as a result, um, we see wide swings in variation. Our EHR inpatient went live on 2014, which is the big dip in uh, 2014, but we're still more than uh, plus or minus two standard deviations from what they're considering, uh, you know, this, computing the z-score, but we don't know if that z-score is computed by, what do they do with extremes and outliers and all of that? It's just a tremendous amount of noise in the metrics they're using for data quality. It's another one, admit date by encounter type. Did you come in through the ED or the uh, directly to the hospital? You know, and, and we probably do have some data quality issues in here, but it's really hard to sort them out. And it's been great for the organization because we're now focusing on trying to figure out what's going on with our data, which hasn't, uh, hasn't been a real motivator for that before. So one of the things we did look do was look at uh, what's going on with our data mart, which we retrieved all those data from our research data warehouse, which doesn't have a single data model behind it. So they create views for what we want. And what, and what we think we want is what we think PCORI is requiring. So think of all the data quality issues along that line. With our business data warehouse, and you can see um, what I want to point out is the uh, Grossly different numbers. This uh, the top line is data mart encounters, and the bottom is the business data warehouse encounters. Magnitudes of difference in the numbers of encounters. Magnitudes of difference in this is a log scale as well, so the changes are are huge. So uh, it's nice to have some of these indicators coming out. It's helping us as an organization to ask what's going on with our data, uh, but we are certainly not feeling like we're ready uh, for prime time research yet. So uh, running out of time, let me just flip through to the end and say some of the informatics challenges. Again, this conceptual modeling of domains. That, like I said, we're participating in multiple federated research networks now. Each of them has a different common data model. Every organization is struggling to get their own org data uh, conformant in the first place, let alone to another one. We need tools out there. Uh, we need... Um, formal models for analyzing and processing the data. There are a ton of metadata challenges. We're looking at quality metadata, provenance, those sorts of things. I'll stop there. Questions? And I don't mean to pa paint a grim picture. I think there's lots of opportunity, but there are lots of challenges with using clinical data. question was, how does this CDM compare to OMOP? And there are several of the networks that are using OMOP to derive their 
uh, PCORI CDMs, common data models. Uh, so it's not a direct comparison. It's more that they are, in those situations, the uh, PCORI CDMs a derivative of OMOP. There are others that are deriving it from, uh, well, I2B2 platforms. Others are, um, there are a variety of flavors of things going on. But obviously, the, the semantics of the data are lost in this space. The syntax we can still handle, and I think some of the pragmatics. But with that semantics piece missing, I think we are unclear of what we're actually getting at the end of the day. Yeah, actually, uh, a, a lot of interest in, in around the data sharing and blockchain and also differential privacy. Our organization is still looking at the unique uh, limited data sets with the HIPAA uh, identifiers, and that's not going to scale at all. Um, Michigan's got a $100 million investment in a data science initiative, and we're hoping to be able to m use this PCORI data mart as a way to move these issues forward if we can move up to that platform. We're sitting on a SQL Server and a SAS server right now, so I inadequate for what the needs are. Mm -hmm. But blockchain would be pretty. We did you any of you see the uh, ONC offered a blockchain paper challenge? Did any of you enter that around clinical data? It was due in August. We spent some time. We thought about it, but didn't uh, didn't quite get our act together for that. Lots lots of opportunities around security in that space. And it, yeah, <laughs> enough said, yeah. And your question about Shrine, you know, I don't know enough about Shrine to answer that. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you Thanks. again. Thanks. Sorry, I had such a hard time. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs>